Hi, thanks so much for joining our webinar today. My name is Jesse Peterson. I'm the Director of Education here at Sunray Construction Solutions. Sunray secures $10 billion annually for GCs, subs, and suppliers. We are a national construction document service. Today's webinar is conducted by the incredible Ted Baum, a New York construction lean log guru. Today's to webinar topic is don't sign a release unless it says this one thing. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the fabulous Ted Baum. Jesse, thank you for that very uh, kind introduction. Uh, thanks again for uh, attending. And um, we'll be talking about some lean related topics and um, some tangents to that. This is intended to be a quick hit, uh, a real um, simple explanation of, of something to consider uh, with respect to lean waivers or releases uh, that you probably deal with on, on almost a daily or at least a monthly basis. Um, so uh, I'll start the show now. Um, this screen just gives you some instructions in the event uh, that you have any questions. Uh, this tells you how to present them um, so that uh, if, uh, if there are questions that I can answer at the end, I'll do my best to do so. Um, I uh, obviously not providing legal advice in this context, but I'll do my best to answer uh, questions that uh, may uh, be applicable to uh, many of your situations. Um, so <clears throat> what we'll be talking about today are lean releases and specifically how to navigate them um, as you work on projects uh, in New York. Um, and this is a New York law specific presentation. Um, that's very important, particularly with respect to lean law. Uh, there are, uh, of course, 50 states and there are 50 different uh, bodies of lean law. Some of them may be similar, uh, but they can be quite different. Uh, and uh, as just a couple of examples, uh, New York permits mechanics liens on both public improvements and private improvements. But other states, such as Pennsylvania, don't permit lien law or liens on uh, public work. Uh, liens are also not permitted on federal work. Uh, so there are some important differences from place to place. Um, where appropriate, I'll touch on, um, on your bond rights, uh, preserving those. Um, those are, uh, bond rights are, usually available on any public work project, should be available on any public work project, not necessarily on private jobs. Um, so we can talk about those as well. I'll be talking about some of the rules and exceptions that apply particularly to lean releases um, and uh, some traps to avoid. Um, and of course, always consider Sunray a, a good resource whether you're hoping to find someone in a particular jurisdiction to help you or uh, just for assistance with, with some of these construction issues. Uh, so <clears throat> lean waivers, uh, they're not just for liens anymore. And I think you'll see what I mean uh, as we proceed uh, through this presentation. Um, uh, lean waivers are, uh, You'll see documents on a, on a regular basis that are called lien waivers. Sometimes they are just that, and sometimes there's something more. And that's the point of today's presentation. So uh, first of all, waivers um, in exchange for payment, it's, it's unavoidable. It's, it's going to be on every job. You're going to be asked to provide, you should be asked to be provide waivers uh, of lien rights when you're paid for a project. Uh, and under New York law, the, the general rule is you cannot waive lien rights in advance. Uh, for example, if there's a contract provision which says uh, that the uh, subcontractor, for example, agrees that it has no lien right on this project, in New York, that's not valid and not enforceable, uh, whether the agreement says that or not. Um, once again, 
this is not true in every jurisdiction. So in Pennsylvania, um, that is a legitimate uh, provision to include uh, in a contract. Um, uh, and so I'm sure people are asking themselves, well, if, if I can't waive my lien rights in advance, then how can I be asked to sign a lien waiver before I ever get the payment? So lien waivers are actually uh, recognized under New York law uh, through case law interpretation as an exception to that general rule uh, in this sense. Uh, you can waive your lien right if you sign the lien waiver shortly before you get payment. Uh, so that is a recognized exception. But what's important to know is if you were to sign a lien waiver and you didn't get your payment, um, then that would not constitute a waiver of your lien right. Um, and it also has to be within a reasonable time. So uh, that doesn't mean if you ultimately get paid, um, the, the lien waiver would kick in and become effective. But if it had been an unreasonable period of time for you to wait, it wouldn't preclude you from filing a lien prior to getting payment. So that's the routine that you're gonna be faced with. Uh, and uh, again, these lien waivers, you're asked to sign them all the time before you get paid. Uh, and everybody always wants to know, um, how can I do this if I don't have the money? Um, but it is, it's perfectly acceptable and it's become routine on every construction job. It's not something to be afraid of, but just know that, know your rights and know that you have the ability to file a lien if you don't get paid, even if you've paid, even if you've signed such a waiver. And we're going to be looking at some particular language in a minute, but here's the problem that uh, is lurking behind this accepted practice of uh, signing lien waivers before you get payment. The problem is that a lot of lien waivers that you'll see now are not limited to just waiving your lien right, but they're used to waive a lot more. Uh, and we'll be talking about that in just a moment. So here is an example of what I would call a pure lien waiver. So the language on the screen in front of you, I've obviously left the dollar amount blank, but um, this is something that just talks about uh, your ability um, to file a lien for the amount that's recited in the lien waiver. Um, so this kind of language is purely related to a waiver of lien. Uh, and so signing this, all you're doing is agreeing that should you get paid within a reasonable amount of time, you give up your right to file a lien for the amount that you were paid. Uh, so if the amount was $10,000 and you're, but it's a partial payment, you're still owed another, say, $90,000, doesn't waive your right to file a lien for the remaining $90,000. It only relates to your ability to file a lien for that $10,000, assuming you receive the payment. Here is an example of what I would call an impure lien waiver. Impure in the sense that it's not limited to the ability to file a lien. So if you look at the language, the longer paragraph, the first paragraph, um, and at about the fourth line down, it says, um, it references claims, causes of action, uh, that should say suits, not suites, uh, debts, sums of money, damages, claims, and demands. Um, all these things are that's far broader than merely a the ability to file a lien for labor and material furnished. Um, and note the second paragraph uh, similarly sort of reinforces the same idea. And it says, if you get the payment, you're not going to file a lien. And you also formally and irrevocably release and waive any lien, but not just lien, also claim, 
or charge of any nature whatsoever concerning the payment for the project described above. Hopefully you can see that this is pretty broad language, which doesn't is not limited to the lien, uh, a lien for a uh, lien right for the amount that is contemplated by this particular payment. And the problem is because you're receiving consideration is what the legal term for this, because you're receiving consideration for this document, your the argument is you have been paid and exchange, you are giving up your ability to make claims. So what does that mean? Well, typically as you go along in a construction project, you might be considering or discussing a PCO or proposed change order. Um, you may have an open claim that has been unresolved even uh, and has been discussed. Uh, and these are rights that you may give up by signing a, an impure lien waiver, such as the one you see on this screen. So how do we handle it? Well, I'm going to use that same provision and give you just one particular example. Um, it's hard to say in general how to deal with it because the language of these lien waivers are going to be different from contractor to contractor, owner to owner, or what have you. So um, it's a little hard to predict exactly how to do it. So I'm giving you one that works with this just to hopefully give you an idea of how to handle it. So you'll see what I did is I put in this, if you can see my arrow on the screen, I put in this asterisk. And then on the next screen, I'll show you what the language you might put in uh, to preserve your ability or carve out from this waiver anything that's an open issue. So for example, the asterisk tells us, and you just write, you could handwrite it, you could type it in if you can manage that or um, put it on a PDF, um, perhaps attach a separate piece of paper. I don't think there's any magic for how you convey it, as long as it's pretty clearly attached to uh, the lien waiver that you send in. So here's our asterisk, um, might have language that says, I mean, let me go back for a second to the prior slide. It says, um, you're giving up rights to services performed, worker services heretofore performed or furnished by the sub in connection with the project, asterisk. And then we say, except for the following. And then I've listed a couple of just examples. Um, so an unresolved proposed change order. You might be able to uh, do this by just listing the PCO number. Um, although I think it's a better practice to also identify the subject matter if it's not going to be too difficult to do. Um, but if, if you have 25 PCOs, you're probably not going to want to list every single one. You could even list one through 25. The point is, be as specific as you possibly can be when you're identifying what the open issues are. Um, you may not, uh, you may be seeking to preserve a claim that is not the subject of any PCO or, or similar kind of document. So my second example, item two, is meant to be a more general statement of what the parties should recognize is an open issue. So issues relating to extra costs, for the extra work described, and I'm saying in a correspondence with a certain date and related to, and then the description, you would fill in what was the topic. So for example, you might say uh, issues relating to extra costs for the extra work described in a correspondence dated June 6, 2024, and related to the uh, additional excavation that we had to perform or the additional materials that we had to supply related to uh, rebar or you know what what whatever it may be um, you may have to be a little bit artful in your description uh, but hopefully you can link it back to a specific correspondence correspondence that's more specific with regard to 
the uh, the item that you're trying to preserve for purposes of the uh, uh, preserving a, a, a claim for an extra and not waiving it by signing this lien waiver. Now, the courts have helped uh, contractors out a little bit, recognizing this risk of waiver inadvertent, uh, it may have been inadvertent uh, to waive rights. Um, so I've given you an example of a case which talks about the fact that um, under certain circumstances, the, the way the parties deal with one another might demonstrate that even though they signed a sort of broad form of release, like the one we looked at, the impure version of the lien waiver, that it might you might be able to escape its effects if there was a course of dealing between the parties uh, that means that makes pretty clear that it wasn't intended to be a uh, there wasn't intended to be a waiver of of the right. Um, this is kind of similar. You may be familiar with the concept of uh, many subcontracts contain provisions which say there will be no changes unless there's a writing reflecting that change or a written change order reflecting the change, that kind of language. Um, that kind of provision in a contract is definitely enforceable under New York law. However, if there's an oral direction, a spoken direction, by, for example, a contractor to a subcontractor, I want you to do this extra work and I'm going to pay you for it. Well, now you've got a direction that's contrary to what the contract says that occurred after you entered into the contract. So the uh, this is a very similar concept. If, there, if there's conduct that is contrary to what the writing suggests, there may be a way to get out, uh, around it. But let me suggest to you, you don't want to rely on that. So um, you might think, well, geez, we, we had a bunch of correspondence uh, that where we were very clear that we had some extra work claims. Um, you don't want to rely on those uh, because uh, you're going to face an argument that if a contract requires you to submit a claim for extra work in a certain way within a certain time and uh, in a certain format containing specific information, then the email or correspondence may not be enough to preserve that claim. So if you, if you do have these unresolved extras, then make sure to identify them in the lien waiver. Um, and I meant I noticed uh, uh, mentioned here at the bottom of the page, you know, even where you have that written notice requirement to preserve claims, the oral directives to perform can trump it, um, and just make be sure to document what happened. As I mentioned just a moment ago, that oral direction is an exception to the written change order requirement, or can be, but you'd be well advised to make sure to not rely on just the oral direction. What I like to tell clients is in a friendly way, you can send a message to the contractor and say, look, um, this is to confirm our conversation. You told me you wanted me to put in three extra windows. Um, I told you I thought the cost would be X, or I told you I would get you with the cost within a few days, um, and we're going to proceed with that work based on that direction. Doesn't have to be nasty, uh, but it can help at the end of the day because what I always tell people is if it isn't in writing, it didn't happen. Uh, obviously, that's not true, but proving something that was spoken is going to be very difficult if you ever had to get into it later down the road. Um, memories fade. Memories can be different. Uh, writings are always what they are. Uh, and that... Uh, brings me to the conclusion of my program. Um, I don't know if we uh, have any questions. I hope that well, was helpful. Yeah, uh, it was amazing. Thank you so much, Ted, for that. That was a really great uh, webinar about some really good information that's 
really useful, real day, everyday stuff for us. So we appreciate that. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come through. And this is actually just going back to pretty much your last slide that you had. And it says, yes, we know written contracts are best. But what if you don't have a written contract? Are you still able to file a mechanics lien? Oh, great question. Yes. Um, so um, oral agreements are as enforceable as written agreements. Okay. Uh, that, that's a general rule. But um, just, just as I said before, keep in mind that and the terms of an oral agreement are going to be difficult to prove. So it doesn't preclude you from making a claim, uh, but it it may preclude you from proving what was agreed to. Okay, all right, fair enough. Thank you for that. Um, all right, and then if you can go back to the the question slide for me, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, all right, and then another question that came through. It says, "What if a sub mistakenly signs an unconditional waiver? Is there any protection protection they still may have?" Um, so that that's going to be tough. Uh, it, 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 it's hard. That's hard to answer, but I'll, I'll try to give you some general concepts. Um, the uh, a lien waiver is effectively a a contract or release, um, and contracts are interpreted uh, as if they're unambiguous. They're going to be interpreted that way. So, if the plain language of the waiver says, "I release all my claims." from this point forward, uh, then you may be bound by that. Uh, you're going to have to rely on um, other evidence. Uh, but some courts are going to say, well, look, I, I look at the four corners of this release document. It says you gave up your right. Um, you gave up your right. Uh, other courts may say, um, I recognize what this says, but that wasn't the course of conduct of the parties. There was something different contemplated. Clearly, both parties were aware. Um, so it's it's difficult to answer. It's really going to depend on the individual circumstances. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, another question that was asked is, um, can a New York mechanics lien be amended? Ah, okay. So yes, uh, there, there are specific rules regarding the amendment of liens. Um, you can amend a lien upward, you may not amend it downward. The solution for downward is to do a partial release. Uh, so, uh, and and you cannot, um, you cannot amend a lien to correct a problem uh, if there's a defect in the lien uh, other than the amount. Um, you can't amend that, uh, particularly after the, um, after the time to file lien has passed. Okay. Uh, so uh, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Thank you. And then I think this might be our final question that has come through, but it says, does a lien have priority over existing mortgages or loans? Another great question and a typical lawyer answer, it depends. <laughs> uh, mostly it depends on that. There are certain protections that banks can, uh, lenders can use to make their um, construction financing a priority. And if they take those ste steps appropriately and it's construction financing, that is gonna be the first priority in terms of payment. Uh, there are examples where banks fail to do that or fail to do it properly, and then the lien does take priority. The lien is going to take priority over other, uh, potentially over other after filed uh, interests. Uh, but if the construction loan it exists first, uh, it, the lien is going to take us uh, back seat. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for, for telling us about that. I appreciate it. All right. So if anyone does think of another question that wasn't asked, please feel free to reach out to me. I will be sure to help answer any questions um, and we will get them addressed for you. All right. Can you go to the next slide for me, please, Ted? Sure. 
All okay. right, so who is ready to win a gift? We're testing your knowledge. See if you guys can answer these questions correctly. If you feel like you know them, go ahead and chime in on the on the questions or chat for us, and then we will go ahead and send you guys out a little prize. So take a look at these. If you know that answer, go ahead and, and send it in. I know Ted had a previous webinar where we went over some of this information, so you might remember it from that. Um, but take a look and see what you can get and we'll send you over a, a little gift from us. So go ahead and go to the next slide for us, please. Okay. All right, here are some of Sunray's resources uh, to help you guys stay organized, know your deadlines, secure your rights. Um, so go ahead and scan that QR code to access these incredible uh, resources. You've got deadline calculators, project information sheets, um, and then the state lien law rules. So as Ted said in his uh, webinar, um, at the very beginning, he was saying there are 50 states with 50 different sets of laws. Uh, if you go onto the Sunray website, you can kind of click on the map there, say, okay, hey, I've got a project in Pennsylvania. What are the rules now applying to this? Um, if it's a new state that you're in, you can click on that and it will tell you, okay, this is what I need to do. These are my deadlines. And it will kind of help keep you guys organized. So go ahead and click on that QR code so that way you have um, access to these incredible resources. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide for me, please. All right, so um, we have a new service available at Sunray. We're going to be do it, helping you guys with your collections. So if you have commercial collections, you can always give us a call and we'll help um, help you get it sorted and see if we can help you guys get paid. All right, go ahead and go to the next slide for me, please. All right, if you don't mind, take a moment to review us on Google. We really appreciate it. It takes about a minute of your time, but it helps um, us get the feedback on these webinars, see what other topics you guys want to hear about and for us to go over, and it helps get this information out to other contractors like yourselves. So we really do appreciate any feedback. All right, and then the next slide for me, please, Ted. All right, and with that, that is all we have for you guys today. Thank you so much for everyone that attended. We hope to see you guys at our next webinar. Thank you again, Ted. You really are incredible. I hope you all have a wonderful and magical sunny day. Thanks again, everyone.